Greetings to everybody. Welcome to, um, what I see now, this is our sixth, seventh, eighth session. Um, and uh, it's been a wonderful day so far. I hope we've all been able to follow as much of it as possible. Um, <clears throat> so in this session, I'd like to introduce our sponsor, Equidium Health. Uh, now, Equidium Health is a consensus partner and a mesh portfolio company creating Web3 person-centered healthcare and research networks. So a fascinating space, particularly given some of the last um, papers we've had. Uh, and we have Dr. Pierre Vigilance um, with us. He is uh, Equidium Health's uh, Vice President of Population Health and Social Impact. Uh, so welcome, Pierre. Uh, his, Hello. Hi, great to meet you. Um, his specialism are, are in how blockchain and decentralized AI technology can improve community health outcomes. Um, and he has uh, deep expertise, uh, including population health strategy um, and uh, you know, facing solutions for entrenched, uh, entrenched problems faced by underserved populations. So, Dr. Vigilance, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Brian, for the introduction and uh, very much appreciate the uh, British Blockchain Association inviting me to speak. Um, Equidium is thrilled to be a partner with you um, for this event and hopefully the event has been good so far. Um, I have been uh, in transit uh, from the Philadelphia area here in the United States down to Orlando for the beginning of a conference, so I apologize for the uh, hotel background, etc. But it's a lot warmer down here in Orlando than it is in Philadelphia, so I won't complain. Um, as Brian mentioned, um, Equidium Health is a, a Web3 company that looks to leverage both uh, blockchain and uh, machine learning capabilities uh, to improve health generally speaking, um, by partnering in the healthcare sector and life sciences. Um, and with my joining the team in uh, about 90 days ago, actually, uh, we are now also pivoting into a population health way of looking at things, which as I'll talk to you about in this couple of minutes is a bit more multi-sector than might typically be considered. Our, our primary operations are here in the United States. Uh, um, but we are looking to obviously be engaged abroad as well, but many of my comments are going to be in the context of the US healthcare system. Uh, so please excuse some of those, uh, the, specific, the specificness of some of those remarks. Um, Heather Flannery is our um, CEO and founder, and uh, as Brian mentioned, we are a, a spin-off, if you will, of Consensus AG. Uh, we were Consensus Health until earlier this year and just rebranded to Equidium um, January uh, 20th, actually, it's about two months ago now. Uh, so we have a few different uh, projects that we are working on, and I uh, wanted to talk to you a bit about the path to population health uh, as a uh, a way of talking a little bit about precise population health and the way that we can get to that is slightly different than precision medicine and slightly different than uh, precision pu public health even. Uh, a little, about me, little bit about me just in an in introduction. So uh, I was born and raised actually in the UK. I was um, I was born in uh, North London. I grew up in the south of London, though. I went to school at a little place called Dulwich College, some of you may be familiar with, and then uh, went from there, left in the late 80s and came here to the US, um, undergraduate degree from GW in biology, and then uh, medical school and public health school at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. Um, did a residency in emergency medicine and thought that that was going to be my route, but was very interested in uh, community health and community health outcomes. Um, and was seeing a number of different things as a medical student and then also in the emergency department that made me realize that, you know, the emergency department was being used overly as a place of primary care. And that is not how the emergency department ideally should be used. And that was because of issues with access to care that different populations had. Some of those access to care issues were a function of insurance, um, some of them a function of income levels, um, and others a function very much of convenience. But there were people coming to the emergency department using it as their primary source of care. That struck me as 
not being uh, appropriate and um, it's absolutely necessary for them, but it was not what we wanted people to be doing ideally. And I wasn't the only one who saw that. So I pivoted into the public health space and into public health administration pretty early in my career. I uh, ran a substance abuse program in East Baltimore for a couple of years where we had coordinated case managers working closely with uh, the treatment centers that they were in, but also with providers of education opportunities, workforce training opportunities, and other needed services for those individuals. That was in the early 2000s, uh, before the current wave of social determinant of health conversation, excuse me, um, was uh, sort of coined. Uh, obviously, Marmot's work in that space predates even that, but we are now in this moment where social determinants are having quite a moment. Um, and quite a bit of attention obviously being paid to them along with health equity and diversity and inclusion. From there went on to work in government for a little bit. I was an associate uh, uh, health commissioner for Baltimore City and then health commissioner in Baltimore County and in Washington DC, the nation's capital. There again, seeing a number of different dots to connect around health and wellness that were not specifically in the health department or under our immediate authority. And that's sort of where this precise population health concept comes from. It is about looking multi-sector and being um, aware of and partnered with people from multiple sectors in order to do the work that's necessary to improve individual health, particularly for underserved communities. Um, spent about 10 years in academia, um, had a full head of hair walking into that, and you see where I am now, so you understand what academia can do to people, and that's no disrespect to all of my colleagues out there who are fully, uh, fully tenured and in that space. Um, but uh, found that to be a very interesting place, but one that wasn't particularly practice-oriented, at least not where I was, and so got the opportunity to do some consulting work and engage in some work with some other partners, family offices, technology companies like Equidium and others uh, landed here at Equidium a little bit ago. And one of the things that we are very aware of, and as we talk about social determinants, is that if we look at health as a pie, if you will, about 20% of that pie is made up of health care. So health care itself is responsible, if you will, for 20% of our health. And the other 80% is our genetics, where we live, and uh, the social determinants of health. So education, housing, transportation, economic development, etc. But in the US, anyway, the lion's share of the responsibility with respect to the social determinants, that other 80% of the pie is placed on healthcare. And so there's a significant mismatch from a skills perspective, as well as a data perspective with respect to what the sector is that is responsible for that, that particular set of work um, and what that sector actually gets with respect to the data that it collects in the clinical interaction. And that clinical interaction provides you with symptoms issues that are of immediate concern to the patient and some things that need to be taken care of, obviously, with a medical eye to it and a clinical eye to it. But some of the issues that might put that person at risk for those issues or put that person in position to have the issues that they're having, be that um, food insecurity, be that housing insecurity, be that an inability to get transportation that's reliable or a number of other things, um, those things are all outside of healthcare itself to take care of. But at the same time, healthcare is still trying to bring all of these social determinant pieces of data into its system, clawing them in through community health workers, screening tools and the like, to pull that information into the EHR for action on the part of a provider, a clinician who might be a physician, a nurse, a nurse practitioner, physician's assistant, social worker, whoever. And this strikes us as being um, appropriate, but at the same time mismatched, because the uh, bringing that information into the EHR still shows that still, it's only about a third of systems um, have comfort with how they are going to use that information. Um, and so the idea for us to be more precise with respect to how we target population health and target population health interventions centers around the individual, but also centers around the fact that that individual interacts with a number of different 
um, entities and organizations in their day-to-day -day life. Um, they interact, obviously, with commerce. They interact with community-based organizations, potentially. They interact with government. They interact with health and health systems. And in each of those places, they, um, they leave data and they leave information or they have to sign in to get service in that particular place. Um, what would it look like for, their, for the network of those organizations to be integrated um, and made into a consortium, if you will, that was connected by a blockchain-enabled network, essentially? What would that look like and how might that improve the ability to gather information that gives us a 360-degree view of the patient and at the same time enables us to then match their needs to the services that, they, um, uh, that they're seeking more effectively. Um, we call that, that scenario, if you will, a, a health utility grid. Um, and that is an interconnected group of organizations and agencies, government, non-government, um, healthcare, life sciences, potentially academia, philanthropy, community-based organizations who are willing to engage together in a blockchain-enabled um, network that allows for the sharing of information without the, without the data having to actually move at all. Data can be um, analyzed at rest. Um, and, but more importantly, reducing some of these silos that are within some of these organizations and between them. So drastically improving interoperability um, and creating uh, a, an infrastructure that actually uh, makes use of or leverages the fact that information coming from these different sectors can come directly from those sectors and be used by everybody who's in this consortium with the patient at the center of this. But I think the thing that makes this most different, and because as I mentioned before, we are a Web3 company, the the concept of owning the data is something that also needs to change. So the system in which those organizations interact is one thing, but then the system within which the patient operates also changes slightly, which is that that patient ideally has ownership of their data and makes decisions about where their data is shared themselves. Now, certainly there are going to be some gaps that need to be filled in levels of knowledge and maturity and literacy, around being able to understand what your data is, where your data can or should go, and how your data most benefits you by going to one place versus another. But putting that ownership in the person's hand and providing them with the necessary tools to be able to interact with those other organizations appropriately is something that we find to be a very um, compelling way and reason to actually try to put together these consortia with the added benefit of the patient med, um, data ownership piece being a part of this puzzle. So there are a few different things that need to happen in order for that to, to actually transpire. So we need to do some of the work that is currently underway to improve digital, digital equity um, and digital literacy uh, so that people can have an understanding of what it is that they're using just as a baseline before they even get into um, their data and what their data is going to be able to do for them. Um, the other part of things there is, and in my estimation, digital literacy and health literacy are actually very much part of the larger scheme of literacy in general. So working with education organizations and school systems, et cetera, to try to just raise the level of understanding that people have of different things um, so that they are able to be more um, engaged in all aspects of life, not just the digital parts of it, is an important piece of this puzzle. We education partners as well as um, academic partners in this as part of the as part of the pie. The um, the other parts of this that are interesting to us are the opportunities to, as I mentioned before, make use of this data at rest. And so, blockchain, as you all very well know, um, provides a number of opportunities for security for the data at rest and in transit. But by leaving the data in, the, in place, um, systems can feel more comfortable and confident that there's not going to be, there aren't going to be breaches that might happen if the data had to move, for example, into a health information exchange or other shared environment. But the other thing is that we can deploy some of the um, machine learning algorithms to those, um, to those locations using federated learning um, 
to engage that data and then have everybody benefit from what's happening at the edge, if you will. So patients being the ones who are holding that data in their hand, in their phone, um, and their interaction with something in particular allows for that data to be the most source data that we're able to get access to. And um, having algorithms be able to interact with what they're doing at that end of things is going to be a move in the direction that we feel is most appropriate and also most useful and beneficial for everybody in these systems. Work to be done, clearly, with respect to pulling together these consortia. And we're very fortunate to be involved with a couple of different companies, um, including Microsoft and Intel, as well as Nokia Labs and, um, and others. And uh, we are constantly working to create new partnerships and opportunities for us to be able to deploy these data integrity learning networks, uh, which essentially is the umbrella under which the health utility grid sits. Another um, part of that puzzle is the veteran facing work that we're doing at the moment in our VICI, which is a VICI, our Veterans Incentivized, um, um, Veterans Incentivized Care Initiative, sorry. Um, and that is the first of the data integrity learning networks, which is going to have us working closely with a veteran serving organization and veterans themselves improving their access to care and a number of other services um, using these, uh, these uh, blockchain enabled networks as a, uh, as a foundation, if you will, for that, for that interaction. Um, the, the movement in this direction is something that is probably well overdue. Um, obviously we are very biased with respect to that, but um, I think that as I've looked at with different communities over the years and and been in different sectors from the nonprofit sector to the academic sector and government uh, the issues are the same through all of them the lack of interoperability the aging of our infrastructure with respect to the technology that's used within government and that prevents government from actually being able to be most effective in serving people within agencies let alone between agencies and we have to work on both of those things um, all of these spaces, as well as in the philanthropic space and the community-based organizations and the work that they do, similarly, issues there with interoperability need to be addressed so that the investments that are made in communities can actually have the return based on improved health outcomes that they actually should be get bringing and not just the repeating the cycles each year of doing the same thing or something slightly different from year to year without seeing significant changes in outcomes. And I mentioned that all in reference to this health equity movement that we're also within a, a moment around, I think, globally around equity. But the health equity movement here in the States, at least, is one that is very interesting because for some, it's window dressing. And that's just me being perfectly frank about it. But for others, it's very much a mission to do with the removal of barriers to access to care and the erection of scaffolding or ramps that allow people to get to wherever they, they want to get to in their pursuit of health and so that they can live their best lives. And that work is work that is partially driven by reimbursement, although in my estimation, it shouldn't necessarily be driven just by that. That's work that we should be looking to do anyway because it is something that raises all ships. And so all of us benefit from improvements in health equity because of the outcome gains that come from that. So that's sort of the, uh, the, the time I have. Uh, I think that this is a, a fantastic opportunity to sort of speak to you about this and, and hear any feedback that you may have about it. We're very much interested in, in partnering with um, people not only here in the States, but abroad to potentially put together health utility grids in other places. Um, and so friendly partners who are looking to become part of this sort of interactive blockchain enabled network of organizations with the patient at the hub or the, the consumer or user or citizen at the hub and being able to use all of the information that's gathered by all of those organizations around that wheel um, is something that we're very excited about and look forward to working with you and, and, and others on in the future. So. Thanks very much for this opportunity. And I don't know if there's an opportunity for questions here now or if that was just the... Uh... No, yes, yes, definitely. Definitely. Thank you very much for that. It's fantastic. Thank you. 
Do we have any questions? Um, I have a question, uh, Pierre, if I may ask. Um, yes. Dr. Nakvi here, uh, BBA president. Nice to meet you. Uh, excellent presentation. Um, I've also been working in the NHS for the past uh, 17, 18 years. And okay. one of the things you touched on is this um, systems such as the National Health Service, which are pretty much, you know, top down systems. Um, how do we move the needle, you know, effectively and, and present our case to funders and policymakers in a more effective way? Because things move slowly. Certainly, we have seen in the NHS with so much talk and excellent discussions we have in the enterprise sector, such as, you know, uh, Equidium and the consensus and others. Um, but when it comes to actually going to the policymakers or the, the chief executive of a national health service or, or, or chair, um, uh, it, it, things move very slowly. So any, any comments or suggestions on how we can effectively bridge that gap and increase their understanding apart from the general education work that we are doing with these conferences and training events? No, it's a, it's a great question. And um, thank you for bringing that up because as much as we talk about the digital divide or digital literacy being a problem for the end user, it's just as much an issue for the executive or the intermediary user, the enterprise level person who needs to understand this. The way that um, we speak to people about this, and it's sort of a, it's an, it's an ongoing dialogue. We're learning what's, what's um, effective with them, but speaking to the issues that they know are already true with respect to the lack of interoperability that exists between their systems or within their systems, um, speaking to the fact that the outcomes that come from, for example, in clinical medicine, um, coordinated care teams that work with community, work in community and with a health system are shown to have significantly improved engagement and adoption of various disease prevention and disease um, management programs, for example, than teams that are not engaged in that way in community. But they lack access to the information sharing capabilities that we're sort of referring to. Um, making them aware of where the uh, opportunities are being taken to sort of leverage new models um, and trying to shake them loose of some of the fear that they have of, uh, of, of engaging in doing things that are new. Now, the speed part of things, I, I, I don't yet have a fix for. And the minute that I do, I, I will certainly <laughs> broadcast that loudly um, from a beach somewhere because I think anybody who can solve that issue um, will, will deserve uh, to retire immediately. But I think that the, um, the, the issue around at least the concern from a government um, operation perspective is typically one of, well, is this going to do what I said I was going to do for my constituents in X amount of time? Um, is it going to be fast enough? And we know that from working with enterprise and working with corporations that, yes, we can do these things quickly. Uh, we just have to get, we, we just need a couple wins and then getting those wins and not incremental small wins. We need actually wins that are very clearly, obviously scalable. Um, yeah. And I think that that's, that makes a difference too, because doing something small in one place is something great, but small in one place. And people don't always see that necessarily at scale, making it clear to people that there is true scalability um, to what it is that we're doing, I think is another way to help them see the vision and uh, bring them along. Yes, thank you. Excellent. We also, we also have a couple of questions um, from the floor. Um, one from uh, Giselle Waters, um, who is Chief of Service Development at Biomira. Um, and she's asking, uh, Dr. Vigilance, who issues consent in the patient ownership structures you share? Who gives, who gives consent? Who issues consent? in the patient ownership structures you share? Yes, my, so this, this, my first disclaimer is going to be that I, there's no part of my introduction that was I, uh, me being a, a tech-specific uh, person. So I am a certainly much more subject matter expert on the population health side of things. My understanding of who is giving consent is that, th that it is the... I, to my understanding, it's the individual. If you're asking whether or not we're sort of undoing the notion of there being a centralized party, my understanding is we're not trying to do that. Um, because I know that if we say we're the ones giving consent, then we're just 
perpetuating existing centralized systems. Um, so I would have to have one of our uh, one of our tech spe tech uh, specialists to actually get back to you to let you know exactly what that looks like. Um, and I can certainly, if if you shoot me a note, I may be able to get you that answer later on today. Yeah, that was from Giselle Waters um, at Biomira. Uh, and there's a second question from Terry Ross, um, who's Director of uh, Innovation Initi Initiatives at uh, the Haskane um, Business School. Uh, and he's asking, uh, what is the upside for organizations to join the consortium? Uh, and wh where do you get your revenue? So the upside for it, I think it depends upon the organization. Um, and so if for some organizations, it's going to be about for say for a hospital, for example, if, we, if you if the outcomes that you improve are things like reducing readmissions or um, reducing um, the number of days that somebody stays in the hospital or improving compliance with them coming for their medications and coming to clinic so that it is that they are in a better state from uh, year to year. And as a result, cost less for the insurance company to pay for. There are, sig there are significant savings to be found in each of those scenarios. Um, and so there's upside there for a, from a health system perspective with respect to that. Um, I mentioned the pharmaceutical end of things there. If people are more compliant with their medications and they're being used more frequently, then there's more data being generated about, about efficacy and all those sorts of things. So there's opportunities there as well. Um, on the government side, um, I think it's also about cost of operations to some extent. So there's some cost savings to be to be found there. Uh, we're envisioning that funding for these ventures is going to be a combination of equity funding for these uh, the health utility grids. Um, the veterans initiative that I mentioned to you before is, is a privately funded operation. Um, but we also think that for the health utility grids, there will be um, some debt related funding as well that will go into those. Uh, the, the object is not to put this cost to the patient, of course, of the consumer, um, but there definitely will be some engagement on the part of equity and debt with respect to the, the hugs that we're talking about. And I just gave a couple of examples of where there's upside. I think it will depend upon the industry and the organizations that are involved. Uh, we don't envision every health utility grid having exactly the same membership, but for the ones that are likely to have health systems, health insurers, and say government involved, I've just sort of outlined what those three, what, what, the, what the areas are that might be um, cost savings at least for them. Great, thank you. Um, and a very quick question from me before we, uh, before we time out. Um, you mentioned interoperability uh, as being one of the main um, sort of stumbling blocks to, um, uh, to, you know, to health systems working effectively. Um, is there not a danger, and it's obviously a very broad question, but is there not a danger of, of replacing one set of op in, in interoperability problems with another set of interoperability problems, given the state of various blockchains? It's an interesting question. Um, I think that if you're suggesting that there are different... So these, these organizations would be on the same... On the on the same blockchain, so this would be based on an, on Ethereum. It would build on we build on Ethereum, so that's what we would be building on, um, and they would all be on the same blockchain. So there wouldn't be that issue with respect yeah. to one blockchain versus another. Is am I am I mistaken? Yeah, 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 that's, yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a perfect answer. Right. Yeah, yeah. So thank that's you, that right. would be it. Yeah. great. Well, thank you very very much. It's been a fantastic talk. Uh, sure. Thank you to the floor for for the questions. Um, and uh, I think, what's next? Your networking session, Brian, at, uh, when we will come back at about 4.45, .40, about 25 minutes. Great, great. We're looking forward to seeing everybody then. Uh, thank you very much, Pierre. Thank you. Uh, thank, you. thank you. I'll end the session now. Bye-bye. Cool. Bye-bye.